Today is a great day to be joining us. We are starting a brand new teaching series here called Life Together. And the whole goal behind this series is for us to grow in our interpersonal relationships, for us to learn more and more what it looks like to be a church and even just to be uh, good family members, good friends, good coworkers, all of that sort of thing. In 1935, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German scholar and theologian, founded an illegal seminary in what was then Germany, uh, a town called Finkenwalde. And uh, this was just four years before uh, the wor- official start of World War II. And at that point in time, the state church in Germany had really been seduced and turned astray by Hitler and the Nazi party. And so there was a uh, contingent of pastors in Germany that started a movement called the Confessing Church. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer really wanted to train up a new generation of pastors and leaders. And he did that by really founding this secret seminary at Finkenwalde. And uh, it was only around for two years and probably only trained a handful of pastors and church leaders, maybe 50 or 60. And yet we will never know the full impact of what was done there this side of heaven, Uh, that there were some powerful things done by that new generation of pastors and leaders. And uh, really what Bonhoeffer sought to do through this seminary uh, was what he calls a new monasticism. Uh, He kind of ran this seminary not just to train people in the academic parts of what it means to be a pastor, but he really wanted to emphasize spiritual formation. So imagine, if you will, that you were a student at the seminary in Finkenwalde. Uh, You would wake up every single morning and you would go right away to pray with uh, the other students, and you would have corporate prayer and corporate worship. And then from there, the rest of your day was pretty much full with chores and study and you know, reading the Bible and all of that sort of thing. And at the end of the day, you would come back together for an evening time of prayer and worship, but this time with a special emphasis on confession of sin. And you would do that every single day. Uh, so you'd wake up and you'd you know, corporate prayer and worship and go to bed. And uh, it was during these two years that Bonhoeffer was teaching and training seminary students uh, that he actually came out with two of his most popular books to this day, one called Life Together. It's where we get the name of this series. It's not, we're, we're not going to be following through you know, the chapters of the book, Life Together, but it's a great name. Good name for the book, good name for the teaching series. So it's a win-win. Uh, and then another book called The Cost of Discipleship. If you know a little bit about uh, Bonhoeffer as... Uh, just a man, he ended up dying 10 years after he founded this seminary, being executed uh, by the Nazi party for being uh, part of a plot to overthrow Hitler and uh, take him down. And so he did end up paying the ultimate cost of discipleship for doing what uh, he believed was good and right at that time. And, and so while he was there, he published these books and you know, he was writing about uh, the training he was doing with seminary students at Finkelwalde. And uh, one of his friends was reading you know, some of the things he published in Life Together. And he came and paid a visit to Bonhoeffer. And one of uh, Bonhoeffer's biographers records this interaction where the friend basically comes and says, don't you think this is a little much? I mean, praying at 6.30 in the morning? I mean, we, we just started a prayer room on Wednesdays at 6.30 in the morning, right? Uh, I would invite you to join us for that. But he says, don't you think this is a little much? You know, all of the training and you know, this, this new monasticism that you're calling it, don't you think this is a little extreme? And uh, instead of arguing with his friend, his biographer records, he takes his friend to the top of a hill, and at the top of this hill, on the one side, you could see the seminary. You could see the student, you know, small group of students learning and uh, doing, you know, doing their work and study and prayer and all of that. And on the other side of the hill, literally right next to where the seminary was, you could see the Nazi troops training. And you could see Nazi planes, you know, taking off and landing, and the preparations for war, essentially. Uh, And what Bonhoeffer says is this iconic line. He says, what we are doing here must be stronger than what Hitler is doing there. This, discipleship and community, must be stronger than that. And that's really the heart behind this teaching series, is that being a part of a church isn't just a social club. It's not just a way to kill an hour or two on a Sunday morning. That this, the life together that you have with fellow believers, must be stronger than the culture that we live in. Otherwise, the culture wins. And we want to grow together. We want to live life together well. We want to grow in discipleship alongside one another. In his book, Life Together, Bonhoeffer writes these words. He says, Christianity 
means community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. No co- Christian community is more or less than this. So here's how I would summarize what he's saying here. Uh, he, he's saying that in Christ, we are the community of God. That's just a statement of fact. Our, one of our core values at Hill City Church is we are what? If you know the core value, we are family. Okay, a few of you know it. The core value is we are family. So let's say it together. We are family. Read our core values. We did a teaching series. Okay, whatever. Uh, we are family. And the, the reason why that's a value for us is it's, it was a value for Jesus, that we believe that you know, Jesus isn't just using a metaphor when he's saying that you are now part of a new family, that we truly have been adopted by God. And for better or for worse, you don't get to choose your siblings when you're brought into a new family, that this, this is just true. It's a statement of fact. Joseph Hellerman, in his book, When the Church Was a Family, uh, coins this new term. He says, we've not only been justified, we've been familified by the gospel. We've been familified. We've been brought into a family. And so that's just true. So in Christ, if you're in Christ, it's not just this individual salvation that you have. Your, your sins are forgiven. You go to heaven. You know, it's not just ride or die, me and Jesus to the end of the road. It's us and God. We are family. That's a significant component. And I would say a very challenging component for us to understand in the hyper-individualistic society that we live in in America today. So that's just a statement of fact, and that's a reality. However, it's not just in Christ we are family. What, what Bonhoeffer is saying is it's through Christ we learn how to be that kind of family. It's through Christ that we learn how to be the community of God. It's, it's something, it's a statement of fact. It's something that we already are. But it's something that through Jesus, the perfect picture of of humanity, that he teaches us how to actually do relationships well, how to actually extend grace to someone, how to actually forgive someone, how to be patient, how to put up with someone who's difficult to put up with. And so that's the heart behind this series, is for us, this series is hopefully going to grow us in how to be the community of God, how to be what Jesus says we already are. Now, here's the good news for you. If you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want you to know this is the perfect place for you to be on a Sunday morning. We want you here. Even if you're not 100% sure about God, you maybe you have a lot of questions and that sort of thing, this is the perfect place for you to be. We we love that you are here and you have the boldness to, to show up at a church service on a Sunday morning. But the good news for you is I believe this teaching series will be especially helpful for you even if you're not yet a follower of Jesus. Because here's the key. You can follow Jesus even if you don't follow Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Even before you've made that decision, you know, that line of faith, I'm a follower of Christ, you can start to put some of the teachings of Jesus into practice. You can follow him in certain ways. And here's what I believe. I believe you'll find that Jesus is right, that Jesus actually does understand the best way to be human. You, you'll, you'll find that if you start putting the teachings of Jesus, specifically in this area of relationships, I believe in all areas, but for, this t- for the purpose of this teaching series, if you, if you come every single week and you grow in these ways alongside followers of Christ and you follow Jesus in these ways, you'll find you'll be a better husband and wife. You'll be a better parent. You'll be a better coworker. You'll be a better friend. And so the benefit for you, and I would, just, I would say I'm so glad you're here and I hope that you stick with it and grow and learn that Jesus is not just worth following in some areas, he's worth giving your entire life to. So today we are going to be our teaching text for today. We're going to be in Matthew 22. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and open to Matthew chapter 22. And if you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and usher uh, can get you a Bible. As always, if you don't own a paper Bible, please steal our Bibles. We would rather have you have a Bible in your hands and in your home than just sitting on a shelf here that's a well-used you know, way that we would, we love spending money on Bibles because people take them and read them. So we'd love for you to do that. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, for, for many of us, may be a familiar passage. It's what we now call the great commandment or the great commandments. And uh, it might be familiar to you, but here's what I would ask, that you would read these words with fresh eyes. You would hear these words with fresh ears as we jump into our main teaching text for today. So this is Jesus Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, now that's a teacher of the Jewish law, not like what we think of with a lawyer. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question in order to what? To test him. So this isn't some nice inquisitive question, like I'm curious about what Jesus thinks about. This is like a trap. He's trying to trick Jesus. And he says, teacher... Which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, let me just set the scene for you. This is the Passion Week. Uh, it's the final days before Jesus would go to the cross on Good Friday. So uh, this is the, the Passion Week is in effect. So this is Jesus' last week before he dies on the cross. And all week, uh, he's been in Jerusalem publicly teaching. And he has these religious opponents, namely the Sadducees. That's one of the groups mentioned here. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They don't really believe in you know, super spiritual stuff. And you have the Pharisees and those uh, the Pharisees are hyper-legalistic, and they're self-righteous and judgmental and all of that. And so both of these groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, have been publicly challenging Jesus. Imagine I get up to teach a sermon, and people just start like hurling like, uh, hurling, like brain busters at me, like, here's a question for you, preacher man, or whatever. That's what it was like, okay? So Jesus is teaching, and then people are like, oh, yeah, I got, I got one that's going to stump you. I got something that's going to trap you. You know, this is the same chapter in Matthew 22 where they try and get Jesus to, say, you know, to, to offend someone by saying, should the Jews pay taxes? And it seems to us like a trap, catch 22. You have the Roman Empire who's in charge, very corrupt, oppressing the Jews. You have the Jews who Jesus is primarily teaching to. And if Jesus says, no, don't pay taxes, that's illegal. Tax evasion was still illegal 2,000 years ago. It's tax season, okay? Do your taxes. Uh, on the other hand... If he says, yes, you should pay taxes to the Roman government, he's all of a sudden lost a ton of buy-in from the Jews, from the main audience that he's speaking to, because they hate the Romans, right? So it seems like he's a catch-22. Now, Jesus, every, I want you to hear this, every single time he's being put to the test by his religious opponents, he wins. Every single time. And so, so in this example, in the, in the taxes one, he says, okay, bring me a coin. So someone gives him a coin. He says, Whose face is on the coin? Whose face is it? Caesar. He says, just give to Caesar what Caesar's. Flips the coin over, mic drop. You know, it's like, whoo, he wins, right? Every single time that happens. And here in this moment, they're putting Jesus to another one of these tests. And this question is not an uncommon question to ask a rabbi in order to see what kind of rabbi this rabbi is. Uh, in the Old Covenant, in uh, the Old Testament, there's 613 commandments. Uh, so we're going to say that Jenga blocks represent these commandments. Any Jenga fans out here? That's good. Both services, healthy amount of Jenga fans. Okay. So here's our Jenga tower. And here's what we're going to say. Uh, these, each of these blocks are going to represent a commandment. So imagine there's not 613 blocks right here. That would be pretty tall. But in the Old Covenant, you, know, you have the Ten Commandments and you have 603 additional commandments. So that's a, every commandment is a block. Okay. So what, what you would do is if you're going to learn from a rabbi or a traveling teacher, what you might ask them is, hey, which one is the most important one? And by how the rabbi answers that, that's going to inform you as to what kind of rabbi that rabbi is. So if the rabbi says, oh, the most important one is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, then you know that rabbi really prioritizes Sabbath keeping and holiness, right? So Jesus answers this, and I want you to hear this, Jesus doesn't answer by making up his own answer here. He's quoting two of the 613 commandments. So these are, at, you can read the Old, the Old Testament and you can find these two passages. When he says, love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, and soul, he's quoting from the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five. The Shema is like for us, you know, John three sixteen. It's like football games, hold it up on a poster. It's like the hallmark Christian verse, John three sixteen. For many of the Jews, it was the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, and soul. That's the Shema, okay? And uh, so when Jesus says that, it's not really a surprise. You can imagine maybe an audible like, okay, love God, right? Like from the Pharisees when Jesus says that. The shocker, though, is the Pharisees ask Jesus for which one commandment is the greatest and how many does Jesus give them? He gives them two. And he actually elevates this second commandment. And the second one is a little bit more obscure than the Shema. The Shema was like famous. The second one, love your neighbor as yourself, comes from Leviticus chapter 19. Read Leviticus 19 as your devotional text this week. 
it's not that interesting. Uh, it's all about, you know, if you're, it, it's things like this. Don't defraud, you know, someone. Don't steal money from someone. If, you ha- if you're an employer and you have an employee, pay your employee what they're worth. If you have a field and you, you know, leave room at the edge of your margin when you harvest, so the people can come through, poor people can come through and they can take food from your field for free. That's Leviticus 19. And then right at the end of this section about money and not stealing money and paying people their rightful wages is love your neighbor as yourself. A little bit more obscure, yes? That's what Jesus includes as the second commandment, which is like the first one. So this is, this is interesting what Jesus does here. They say, which one is the best? And he says, here's two. Now, this is what it means for us. He says, on these two commandments, so I'm just gonna put my commandment right, right back here. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So that means two things. That word depend is the Greek word kremanumi. Everyone say kremanumi. Kremanumi. It's, it's literally can mean hang. When Jesus is nailed to the cross and it says he, he's hanging on the cross, kremanumi, right? He's, there's, it's a weight-bearing word. It means there's, there's, if you're hanging something, you need a level and you're, you find the stud and that's kremanumi, right? And so this is a, a word that, of, of putting weight onto something. So here's what it means. We've got two blocks down here at the bottom. I removed the middle box. So you got the love God, love your neighbor as yourself right here at the bottom of our Jenga tower. What he's saying is those are foundational commandments. And if you're getting those two commandments right, the rest of the commandments are gonna follow suit. So for, let's look at the 10 commandments. Don't worship any gods before the God of the universe. If you love your, the Lord your God with your heart, mind, and soul, you will not worship other gods right? If you've got this one right, then the other ones about loving God will follow. Now let's look at the love your neighbor as yourself. Some of the other 10 commandments. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you won't murder them. (laughs) It's pretty simple, right? And so if you've got the love your neighbor down, these other ones that have to do with loving, and in Leviticus 19, if you love your neighbor, you'll pay them appropriately. You won't try and steal and skim money off the top, right? Those are the kinds of things. So in a positive sense, if we get these two commandments correct, the rest of the commandments really are gonna follow. But it also works in a negative sense. If you're missing one of these two commandments, every other one comes tumbling down. So we've got our two foundational pillars. What do you think would happen if we just take one of them out? Let's do a science experiment. How about that? Well, cause and effect. Let's just say that this one is the love your neighbor as yourself. I'll just take it off. It falls. And the reality is Jesus isn't saying, yeah, you, you could keep that, I guess. Yeah. So what Jesus isn't saying is that loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself are the same. He's not saying they're synonymous. What he's saying is they're inseparable. They're inseparable. And a life following God does not work if you're missing one of those two major components. And we actually see Jesus continuing on in this teaching in Matthew 23. So if you're still there in Matthew 22, just look over uh, just a little bit. In Matthew 23, verse 13, what Jesus does next is he's actually speaking these woes. That's not like, whoa, you guys are great. It's like a woe, like like a mourning or a grieving. These are words of judgment to the Pharisees, the specific group that has asked him this challenge. And he says this in Matthew 23, verse 13. He says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. Now that word is just another way of saying a convert. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. You won't find that passage in like a Christian greeting card, will you? (laughs) It's difficult. Matthew 23 is a difficult pronouncement of judgment on the Pharisees. But here's what I want you to see is the Pharisees are missing the love your neighbor as yourself. And what Jesus is saying is when you're missing that, you're missing the whole point. Here's maybe an easy way to understand it with a math equation. Holiness, which is what the Pharisees have, they have this legalism and personal holiness. They're the ones who are really careful about being unclean, not eating unclean foods, not associating with unclean people. They hate tax collectors and sinners. Holiness minus love equals hypocrisy. Holiness minus love equals hypocrisy. That word hypocrisy is another way of just saying acting. It's just a show at that point 
in time. See, the Pharisees think we can just have the love, the Lord your God, heart, mind, soul, and strength, but you can hate everybody else, and you, and you can build a perfectly good tower, and what Jesus is saying is no. They think they're spreading the kingdom of heaven, but Jesus says you're actually spreading a different kind of kingdom. It's the kingdom of hell. And every time you convert someone to your kind of religiosity, what's happening is you're actually pulling, you're shutting the gate to the kingdom of heaven in their faces and preventing them from going in. That's what I mean when I say this is serious, church. This idea of love is serious. This isn't some fringe thing. Yes, it's just me and God, and, and it doesn't matter how I treat other people or relate to other people. According to Jesus, this is so incredibly serious. In John 13, this is what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, when Jesus says this, and he says, a new commandment I give to you, is love one another a new command? We just talked about it. All the way, it goes all the way back to Leviticus, right? Loving one another is not a new command. The new part about this command is Jesus says, love one another just as I have loved you. It's to what degree are we called to love one another? And the degree to which we're called is the same degree in which Christ has loved us, which, if you know the gospel, is Christ laid down his life for us. He suffered and died for us. And so what Jesus is saying is that's, that's the 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 level or degree to which we must love each other with this really difficult kind of love. Now, we need to ask the question, when it comes to love, what do we mean? So we've used the word love a lot. The word love is used a ton of times in the New Testament. What kind of love do we mean? I love my dogs. I love my daughters. Hopefully differently, right? <laughs> that you love pizza and you love your mom. Like, that's a different kind of love. And did anyone see the New York Life Insurance Super Bowl commercial? Anyone watch the Super Bowl at this church? No. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a New York Life Insurance Super Bowl commercial. And as it showed up, I was like, that could be like an intro video for a sermon. That it was a, it was a 60 second clip about the four kinds of love used in, in the Greek language. So we're just going to look at that, the four kinds of uh, Greek usages of the word love. Now, this was popularized, these four different kinds of love, by a, a, a book written by C.S. Lewis. It was a record of a series of radio talks that he did, and you know, he goes through and talks about the significance of these four kinds of love. So let's look at these. Uh, the first one is eros. It's the romantic kind of love. Uh, you go on a date with someone, you know, you're physically attracted to someone, that's eros right there. Uh, storge is family love. Uh, it's, you know, a love between a, a grandchild and a grandparent, just like this, this, this familial bond right there. Uh, philia, which is friendship, it's like your buddies. It's the people you, when you have free time, the people you want to hang out with, you, you're friends with them, right? And then you have agape, which is a selfless kind of love or a sacrificial kind of love. And I, what I thought would be helpful is if we just took a moment and look at the New Testament usage of each of these Greek words. Because that'll, that'll inform us to what kind of love Jesus really is concerned about when he teaches us to love one another. Eros is used zero times in the New Testament. Storge is used zero times. Philia is used how many times? One time. And agape is used 117 times. And so it's, it's fairly clear when Jesus is calling us to love what kind of love he's calling us to have. He's not just calling us to be friends. He's not, certainly not calling us to romantically love everyone. What he's calling us is to sacrificially or selflessly love others. Now, to be fair, the verb form of philia, phileo, is used 25 times. So in the New Testament, there is a precedent for we should be friends with one another. We should have friends and, and cultivate those friendship relationships. Uh, and at the same time, though, agapao, which is the verb form of uh, agape, is used 145 times. So the command, love one another, is used over and over and over and over again all throughout the New Testament. The agape kind of love, uh, the Bible Project defines it as this, seeking the well-being of others regardless of their response. It's this idea of giving without thinking about what you get. It's pouring out without you know, worrying if someone says thank you or if they pour back in to you. At this point, I was 
hoping to show a Bible Project video today because they've done, if you're familiar with the Bible Project, they're based out of Portland, Oregon. They come up with phenomenal just Bible study videos and blogs and all of that sort of stuff. I would encourage you to go check out their website, bibleproject.com, and they have a word studies series that just does an overview of the New Testament usage. They have one on the word agape. We were gonna watch it, but I'm preaching way long today and it's a four minute video, so watch it this week. Okay, now what I wanna do is shift gears from the Pharisees, right, because they had this, this holiness, this self-righteousness mindset, to the Corinthian church. Uh, some of you are familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's called the love chapter. Uh, you may have heard it uh, read at every other wedding you've ever been to. Uh, but the reality is, it's not talking about eros. It's not talking about romantic love. Now, that's not to say that agape love is not essential for a marriage to function. I think it very much is. So it's appropriate that it's used at weddings, but it's not intended to be used at weddings. 1 Corinthians 13 is intended for the church. It's literally written by the Apostle Paul to the church because there's a lack of love going on. If you read the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13, what you'll find out is the Corinthian church did not have an issue, uh, did not have this emphasis on holiness. In fact, you can read earlier in 1 Corinthians, they were not a very holy or righteous group of people. There's a lot of immoral stuff going on at the church in Corinth. The thing that the Corinthian church were really holding on to, you could say, is spirituality. They were having these really wild spiritual experiences, and they had a heavy emphasis on the more miraculous gifts and that sort of thing. And in 1 Corinthians 13, the first few verses, what Paul says is, listen, you could have the most crazy prophetic gifting of anyone, and you can know the most you know, divine depths of mysteries of the universe, but if you don't have love, and he uses this other word, so here's our new equation, spirituality minus love equals nothing. He says it a couple times in the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13. So hypocr- or holiness minus love equals hypocrisy, but spirituality is just another, another way that, you know, it's kind of a buzzword in our culture today. I don't go to church, but I am spiritual, right? I'm spiritual, <laughs> that sort of thing. And what, what Paul is saying is that's no excuse, though, for lack of love that it's all about love. Jesus summarized the entire law and the prophets. You could say the whole point of what it means to follow God with love. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So with that in mind, that's the situation of uh, the church in Corinth. Let's go ahead and just go through his list of defining love from 1 Corinthians 13, verse four. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then in verse eight, he says, love never ends. Now, more so than that just being a good list, what I want you to think about for a moment is Paul is bringing this idea of agape love, which Jesus defined really well in his sacrificial death for us. And he even said, perfect love is this, that you would lay down your life for your friends. That that's the ultimate you know, measuring stick of love is what Jesus has done. But the reality is, tomorrow morning, you're probably not gonna have to take a grenade for someone. You're probably not going to have to literally lay down your life for someone else. And so what Paul is doing, is he's taking this agape love is dying for someone or laying down your life for someone, and he's making it way more real and down to earth in your everyday life. He's saying, yes, yes, it is laying down your life for someone. You know what else it is? It's not being rude. That's so simple. And yet what Paul is saying to the Corinthians is that's also love. That's also the agape kind of love that Christ has called us to have both with God, but also with your neighbor. And so what I want to do is I just want to kind of break this verse down into the list, into two lists of the things that Paul says love is and the things that Paul says love isn't. What I'd like to do is honestly assess yourself in these areas and ask yourself, am I loving in how I'm embodying this characteristic? Maybe if it helps for you, you could jot these down. You could do like a self, like things I would do in my journaling is I would do like one to five, how Much do I embody or not embody this, right? So you can do that sort of thing if that's helpful for you, but just ask yourself the question, do you exemplify these kinds of real, everyday, down-to-earth ways of loving? So here's the list of things that love is and love isn't according to 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. How many times do you forgive people when they wrong you? 
How patient are you with, with people when they're taking a long time? Or do you lose your cool easily? Love is kind. When is the last time that you just wrote someone an encouraging note or called them just to encourage them or did something genuinely nice or kind for someone without expecting anything in return? Love is or, or does rejoice with the truth. Do you care about what's true or do you care about being right? Do you care about looking good when you're in an argument with someone or do you humble yourself enough to say, I was wrong and, and genuinely seek out truth? Love bears all things. Do you put up with difficult people or do you have a way of putting walls between you and them in your life? Love believes all things. Are you someone who is always assuming the worst? Just to be safe, I'd rather assume the worst about this person, about this situation. Or do you assume the best in people? Do you believe the best in people? Love hopes all things. Would you describe yourself as cynical? I remember having a conversation and just saying to someone, I'm just a cynical person. They said, that's not a natural human characteristic. It's not like, oh, I'm just a compassionate person. It's like, cynical is, is a character flaw. It's something that comes from the fallen nature of the world. So are you cynical or are you hopeful? You're looking for the ways that God could move and what God could do in this situation or the next. Love endures all things. Do you persevere or you do, do you give up way too easily? Let's look at the things that love isn't. Love is not envious. Do you care more about people or what people have to offer you? Are you always comparing yourself to others? Are you always wanting to purchase things that others have because you want the life that they're presenting on social media? Love is not boastful. Think of, look at your social media post. Who are you promoting? Who do you talk about most when you're in a conversation with someone? Is it yourself and lifting yourself up? Is it kind of that one-upmanship that we talk about where someone shares something and you say, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, but listen what I did. Or are you interested in others? Are you lifting up others? Love is not arrogant. Do you serve others? Or do you expect others to serve you? Love is not rude. Are you someone who other people would describe you as easy to be around? Or are you abrasive? And do you come off harsh? Love does not insist on its own way. How do you respond when someone else gets to pick the restaurant, or someone else gets to pick what to watch on TV? Or do you insist on your own way? And if you don't get your way or your opinion, then you will be so offended. Love is not irritable. How much does it take to make you angry? Is it the littlest thing can set you off, or can you endure quite a bit? Love is not resentful. Think honestly in your life right now, are you holding grudges? Is there bitterness pent up in your heart right now? That is not love. And then the last one, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. When you see other people who are sinning, do you care? Do you care about the, the destruction that they're bringing on in their own lives? When you see other people suffering in the world, do you care? Or are you just apathetic and only concerned with your own well-being? We need to, as followers of Jesus, not just have this generic, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty loving person, or do you love your neighbor as yourself? Pretty much. We need to be specific and say, are you really embodying this kind of love in your life? See, all of the things that Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 13, they have a lot to do with our interpersonal relationships and what I would call our emotional intelligence or our emotional health. A resource that I would encourage you to read if today is especially challenging for you uh, is the book Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pete Scazzaro. Uh, this is what he says. This is kind of the premise of his book. He says, emotional health, the love your neighbor component, and spiritual maturity, the love the Lord your God component, are inseparable. It's exactly what Jesus is saying when he's saying these two things hang the whole law the prophets. You can't be a super spiritual or a super holy person if you don't love your neighbor. That's the essence of this. And I'm, I'm speaking not just as someone who's saying, you have a problem. I'm speaking as someone who recognizes that I have a problem as well. And that this journey towards emotional health is a long journey. I'll tell you, 10 years ago, when I first started off in youth ministry, there were, I was surprised not like every week, but from time to time, there would be you know, a leader or you know, someone in ministry would come up to me with a problem. And the problem would be with me. 
It would be something I said. They would say something like, oh, you were so sarcastic and, you know, whatever, or you were, I felt like you were really harsh the other day in this interaction, this, that, or the other. And I'll tell you how I responded for the first couple years of ministry. Why do people have to be so sensitive? Can't they just know my motives or I didn't mean it the way that I said it? Or can't they just, you know? And the problem was always who? Them, other people. The problem was always it's their fault. They took it the wrong way. They didn't really understand what I meant. But the reality was I had to come to terms with the common denominator in every one of those interpersonal problems was me. And I had to genuinely understand I need to grow in gentleness. I need to grow in not being rude. I need to grow in reducing the amount of sarcasm. I need to get a better filter with how I speak. And I would hope that in the last 10 years in ministry, I have grown by the power of the Holy Spirit in my life and by the, by the word of God convicting me time and time again. And I just say this again, humbly to you for you to consider that if you're thinking today about love your neighbor as yourself, if there are interpersonal problems in your life, conflicts in your life, the common denominator in every single issue you experience in interpersonal problems is you. You are the common denominator in those situations. And I'm not saying it's 100% your fault. I'm not saying that your motives weren't right when you, when you said that or did that. All I'm saying is we need to be people who are serious in growing in love. We need to seriously consider the emotional health that God is calling us to have in our lives. Uh, the beautiful thing about Christ is he doesn't just tell us, go love people. He does it. He, not, he doesn't just teach us to love, he embodies and demonstrates truly what love is himself. Let's look at 1 John 4, verses eight and nine. It says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, so this is the perfect picture of love, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. That's a one sentence version of the gospel right there that God sent his son into this world so that you could have life. Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that you can have life and you can be forgiven from your sins. And what the apostle John is saying is that is love. That's what love looks like. Now, when John says that God is love, that, that, that verse has been kind of like twisted and used weird. You know, here's how I would explain it. You know how a square is a rectangle, but every rectangle is not a square? You know that? Math, okay, right? That God is love, that, that doesn't mean that love equals God. That every time there's love happening, that God is doing that or in, in that situation, right? This isn't the romantic kind of love, this is the agape kind of love, right? So what John is trying to teach us, he's trying to teach us that the way that we even know what love is, is we look to God, who is the author and the creator of this kind of love. And the perfect picture, the manifestation or the revelation of this kind of love is Jesus dying on the cross. So here's what this teaches you and me. Here's our main idea for today. Love sparked the gospel, and the gospel sparks love. So love sparked the gospel. You know, you could ask the question, why did Jesus die on the cross? The answer to that question is love. John 3, 16, for God so loved. It was God's love for you that led the Father to send the Son to die on the cross for your sins. And so for you, one of the most important things you can hear today is just that Jesus loves you, that God loves you, that he cares about you in a selfless, sacrificial way. He has paid the cost to bring you home. At the same time, that if you experience the gospel, it necessarily sparks love in you. That you can't, you can't claim to have really accepted and experienced God's love for you through the gospel and have it not transform you to be a more loving person. That love sparks the gospel, but also the gospel sparks love. It should make us more loving individuals, better spouses, better parents, better friends, better coworkers, but it should also create a more loving community, a kind of community that this world so desperately needs. And as we grow in this love your neighbor as yourself, that as we do this, it would be stronger than that, than the alternatives that the culture has to offer. So how do we do this in our lives? Let's look at some practices. Uh, practicing love your neighbor as yourself. The first thing is you need to know who is your neighbor. So here's our first practice. Get to know your neighbor. Look to the left, look to the right. People sitting next to you, that's your neighbor. Someone who's literally sitting next to you. You know, in church when people are like, turn to your neighbor and tell them about your week. We won't do that today. But 
Uh, that's your neighbor. Think of the people who live next to you in your neighborhood. Literally, neighbor, that's your neighbor. People who you work with, that's your neighbor. Your family, of course, is your neighbor. That's, what, that's the kind of thing. In fact, Jesus was quizzed on this by uh, the Pharisees as well. In Luke chapter 10, you can read about this. This is what sparked Jesus to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, the, the question that prompted the story of the Good Samaritan is, yeah, I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor, though? Because the Pharisees were looking at, only other Pharisees? Is that legit? And Jesus is like, no. And he tells them the story. And the story goes like this. You know, there's a guy who's traveling. He gets robbed. He gets beat up. He's lying dead and bloody on the road. And the neighbor, the one who says, that's my neighbor, is a Samaritan who doesn't know this guy. He doesn't even know his name, but he loves him. And Jesus says, that's the neighbor. Anyone you come across, anyone you have the opportunity to love is your neighbor, especially the people who you see frequently or often. And so Jesus, it's significant. Jesus doesn't say, love God with your heart, mind, and soul and be a generally loving person. He says, love your neighbor, specific. Put a name to that. Put a face to that. We specifically need to love actual people in our lives. We can't just claim to be generally loving people, we have to actually go out, get to know the people in your life, develop and cultivate relationships. Because the reality is, you can't love someone if you don't know them. You can't really love your neighbor in the way that God intends you to if they're just kind of this faceless, nameless, random person. We need to be cultivating actual relationships. Practice number two is the how. How do we do that? We need to grow in emotional health. We need to grow in emotional health. We need to be people who are ruthlessly committed to being convicted and open to being convicted by the Holy Spirit to our own character flaws, our own family of origin issues, the, the ways that we are harsh to people or rude to people or that we assume the wrong things about people, and we need to allow God to grow us in the fruit of the Spirit. We need to be better at interacting with other people. Uh, I hope that I'm less of a jerk today than I was 10 years ago. And I pray that we would, as, as followers of Jesus, grow in emotional health. So read through 1 Corinthians 13, verses four through seven this week. Reflect on that. Pray through those things. You can also read through that Emotionally Healthy Spirituality book. If you wanna get like, like nerd out on this, you can go to emotionallyhealthy.org. There's a free assessment to find out how emotionally healthy you are. You can go there. You can take that free assessment online. And allow yourself to be convicted. Allow yourself to be open to the ways that maybe you're not as emotionally healthy as you think you are. Uh, number three is what? So what does it look like? What should we do? We have to do something. Do something loving towards people. Uh, agapao, the verb, is used 145 times in scripture. Go love someone versus the noun 117 times. It's significant that love is used more as a verb than a noun in the New Testament. Love is something we do. It's not just something we have or something we fall into. Love is something we do for others. Jesus showed us love when he died on the cross. He also showed us love when he washed his disciples' feet, when he ate a meal with Zacchaeus in his home who no one else wanted to be friends with. He showed us love when he healed people and cared for the sick. And so for you in your life, do something. Actually think about get to know your neighbors and then do something loving for those people. Do something helpful for those people. Care for them in tangible ways. And then the last one is why. The why is the gospel, is that we would know God's love, that we would know God's love for us. It is impossible to pour from an empty cup. The reality is the only way that we can cultivate this kind of agape, selfless, sacrificial love culture is if we are being constantly filled up through the good news of the gospel, constantly filled up by the love that God has for us. So if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, Know God's love for your life. Remember God's love and his presence in your life. And here's what I would say to you if you're not yet a follower of Jesus is know God's love for your life. Understand the reality and the truth of the gospel that there is a God who loved you enough that he sent his son to die for you, to be raised back to life so that you could have new life in him. And would you just appeal to him to cleanse you from your sin and turn to him with a clean conscience and have him lead your life? It's that love that sparked the gospel, and for us, the gospel has to spark love. 